Khan, supporting the Red Team Village. Uh, we're very honored to have you here. And with that said, uh, take it away. Well, hello, everybody, and good morning if you're just waking up. I am so happy to be giving this presentation at the Red Team Village at DEF CON Safe Mode this year. Coming to you live from my um, tiny little Amsterdam house. And hopefully I can uh, bring some energy and wake some people up. So this is called Pwn the World. So if you don't know much about me, my name is Chris Kubeka, and uh, I am the CEO of two companies, uh, one in the UK and one in the Netherlands that deals with critical infrastructure protection and high-level incident response. I'm also a distinguished non-resident fellow at the Middle East Institute for their cyber program, dealing with a lot of these issues in the Middle East. Um, my areas of main concentration are critical infrastructure, lots of different uh, ICS, industrial IoT, and especially cyber warfare, as I've been involved with several high-level cases of cyber warfare in the past and continue to do so. Uh, previous to this, I headed the uh, Information Protection Group and in, uh, International Intelligence Group for the Rampo family. And uh, not that many years ago, I won't date myself, I was an air crew member and uh, also with Space Command dealing with command and control systems. So <clears throat> let's briefly talk about what a control system is, because uh, this is my favorite part of technology where you get to actually uh, move things or uh, set things in motion to where um, once you program something, it then has a set series of responses that it does. And we see this everywhere, inside your home, inside uh, power plants, inside aircraft, inside uh, space assets, uh, all sorts of industrial things like uh, the manufacture of masks, uh, and even uh, your coffee maker is in and of itself a control system. And hopefully everybody's had loads of coffee today. Believe it or not, I haven't. That's okay. So some of the things that we have to remember is this. Um, now, the previous speaker was talking about Zoom, and we're actually coming to you live over Zoom and Twitch, is that um, when we're talking about technology, we have to think of the fact that uh, a lot of technology is pushed out there as quickly as possible to gain some sort of edge in the market. So it's quite common to have what I call profits over vulnerabilities. And when we're dealing with control technology, um, there's also a lot of legacy devices. Uh, good for instance is the BART public transport system uh, inside and outside uh, part of San Francisco has such old legacy equipment, they have to look on eBay to get any sort of replacements. And I've dealt with other public transport companies where they've got signaling systems that are almost 50 years old. And since they can no longer find these systems, they actually have to fabricate them. And they've been trying to update them and turn them into IoT systems, which has been extremely challenging. When you build a power plant, you expect that power plant after, you, after you've spent millions, hundreds of millions sometimes, or if you're talking about nuclear power, billions, uh, you expect that type of hardware and the software running it to last for quite some time. Of course, there's a mismatch because um, when we start integrating, as we have already in the past, uh, say Windows systems into hardware that's meant to last uh, 10, 20, 30 years sometimes, uh, you obviously get this mismatch and uh, vulnerabilities are introduced into this type of hardware. Now, uh, the longer something is up and running, the more things end up getting plugged into it. And many companies, governments, et cetera, don't know that they've got orphan servers that are hanging out there, that uh, they had some sort of connection that one person knew about. It could be anything from uh, something stuck in a closet to run reports, and they all, there's one case where they only found out at one organization about this because they were renovating the office building, and they uh, found in the wall a couple of cables, a power cable and a network cable, broke the wall down, and in there was a reporting server. So these types of things happen. But at the same time, we also have to remember that our modern world is most definitely driven on technology and digitization, and that can also come uh, with a 
bit of a cost when we discuss geopolitics. Not everyone is friends, and sometimes your friends are actually frenemies. And um, we have to realize that we have become uh, as dependent on ICT systems as we have on oxygen at this point in time. Funny enough, oxygen is produced uh, in a control uh, system environment. Now, to uh, make matters even worse, lots of different companies, organizations, et cetera, deal with third parties. Uh, you can't manufacture, program, and do everything yourself in a closed bubble. And sometimes that means that there could be, like in Target situation, an HVAC company who had access to Target. And unfortunately, they were used as a conduit for attack. So we have to think about these things when we think about some of the risks and security challenges with control systems and technology. So I do a lot with critical infrastructure, and that's the type of stuff that really uh, keeps the modern world going. But interestingly enough, there's no international consensus as to what critical infrastructure is. I was on a recent uh, call doing a presentation for the United Nations, and I brought up with one of the presenters that, um, because I live in the Netherlands, we're the second largest food exporter in the world. Tiny country, 17 million people, but we produce and export number two in the world. And the reason for that is um, our farmers have drones and robots, and it's highly sophisticated. So we've got a lot of industrial IoT systems and ICS systems that are mixed in. And I brought up the fact that for the Netherlands, for example, that agriculture should be considered part of critical infrastructure. Of course, this varies from country to country, region to region. Uh, I would not expect Mongolia to think of port security as critical infrastructure, but I would here in the Netherlands or the United States for any place that has a lot of different ports that they depend on. So... One of the reasons why some of this stuff is so insecure is the companies who make the hardware and or software are not in security. They're in it to make things interoperable so that they work together and produce what they're supposed to do. And another very interesting factor is when you're dealing with control systems, uh, we've seen this uh, triad, the, the triangle, excuse me, uh, of CIA, where confidentiality is queen. However, in the industrial world, availability is. So if you have to pile on things like encryption or lots of authentication, you can cause latency to encrypt, decrypt, encrypt, decrypt, etc. And from the moment you press a button or send what's called a set command, you want that to go through the system as quickly as possible. And unfortunately, that means that security is actually the bottom part. It's availability, integrity, and confidentiality. That's the order that it goes for critical infrastructure and control systems. Now, another major factor is that the vast majority of critical infrastructure and control systems are privately owned. So there are limitations to what a government can regulate, legislate, and dictate to a company because there are going to be costs associated with securing this infrastructure. And... Um, we have to ask the question, how much does water cost uh, right now versus uh, less risky water infrastructure? Or are hospitals going to have to choose between uh, tightening up and securing their ICT systems, uh, which are included a lot of medical IoT devices and building control systems? Or are they going to buy a ventilator or an MRI machine, et cetera? So um, there is an absolute cost associated with this. But at the same time, we're absolutely dependent on this stuff. So uh, the other day for this presentation, what I did was I uh, used census to do a massive scan across the internet using their ZMAP project and uh, was trying to concentrate on things that I could immediately find uh, that were related to uh, industrial IoT, control systems, and uh, things of that nature. And the problem is, I found a heck of a lot. And this was just the top 10 things. As you'll notice, there's a lot of SCADA systems, which are supervisory control and data acquisition, which connect a lot of the backbone, so to speak, of ICS systems, building control systems. These can vary from 
security stations. Um, a lot of police departments use these, especially in the United States and China. Uh, also HVAC. Uh, my personal favorite protocol uh, for control systems, which is Modbus. I'll tell you why in a moment. Uh, so there's a lot of these things that are exposed on the internet right now. And when I say, please hack me, the reason being is, even if you've got a modern system, yay! And uh, when it comes to the point of, hey, we have a patch, we need to update this, a lot of organizations won't do that very quickly because they're afraid that it will lose it, that interoperability function. And you don't want to do that in, I don't know, a water processing plant uh, and then knock out everybody's water for a short time. So one of the reasons why I like Modbus is when it was created, it was created a long time ago, um, there is no real, really any authentication or security. Uh, and here, this protocol, because it was made open source, was adopted like crazy. Uh, as quickly adopted as Zoom was during the pandemic, basically, because it didn't cost any money to do so. And uh, it communicates between different types of equipment. Uh, it's got to be on the same network, uh, though. Uh, it will also transmit all sorts of data between a SCADA system and what's called a remote access terminal unit. Uh, one of my other favorite features is the fact that it uses ladder logic, very much like a firewall. And if any of you have seen a firewall with 2,000 plus uh, different rules, you'll know that if part of that ladder logic is not done correctly, then um, your security settings in that firewall, just like the ladder logic, um, will actually uh, moot and make the... Uh, oncoming settings uh, absolutely useless. And uh, it also has um, a slave to master architecture. So it's kind of old school. Some of the things that you'll see using Modbus are PLCs, or programmable logic controllers, uh, the remote terminal units. There are actually some modems, uh, industrial modems that still use this, as well as parts of some systems with uh, certain types of SMS and old school paging, which happens to be used in a lot of hospitals still. And uh, there is some safety equipment that is actually used with Modbus, uh, but less and less nowadays. So I'm gonna start introducing you to some tools. Because see, Modbus, although uh, some versions of it can run over TCP IP4, um, it's not, say, directly translatable, uh, meaning uh, everything is in hexadecimal code. And uh, also a lot of the regular IT-based hacker tools and scanners can't actually reach in really, really deep to see anything past, hey, this port's open. Uh, so we have to use some additional tools to get what we need. One of the things I like about uh, the tools that I'll be showing you is the fact that they are absolutely legitimate tools that would not trigger, say, an antivirus alert for a potentially unwanted uh, program. On the contrary, they would be expected to be used uh, as a technician or engineer in many of these different environments. And uh, all of the tools that I'll be showing are free as well if you want to get started. So Chipkin has this wonderful Modbus scanner, and what you do is once you can find something that says, hey, I got port 502 open and my banner says Modbus, you go ahead and you plug in the IP address, and it will then look even deeper, and what it will show you is everything that's on its network behind that IP address. So in this particular case, it isn't just one thing that's at the IP address, it's multiple things that are at the IP address, and we'll also show you different things like uh, functions, which are very important in Modbus. Uh, now, another thing that I like, uh, this one again is uh, free from plcdatatools.com, is once you find an IP address, it will go ahead and scan it and tell you which type is actually running. And sometimes you can get even more information uh, than just what you're seeing right now on your screen. So in this case, I took an IP address 
and went ahead and scanned and found the firmware version. If it's running, obviously it's running. Um, what the code is, which is a manufacturer code, and also uh, picked up the fact that it is running something called Siemens S7. And this is a proprietary uh, protocol created by Siemens. If you've never heard of Siemens S7, um, this was the uh, type that was running in the Iranian uh, nuclear enrichment uh, program when Stuxnet hit it. Uh, so a, a PLC, Programmable Logic Controller, running Siemens S7. And this is quite handy, too, because if you find things that have not been updated, which the vast majority have not been updated recently, you can also couple those with various exploits that are known and use them against them. And another thing is because it's kind of slow to do a lot of these security updates, and also, although Siemens does a lot nowadays, or ICS security, um, you can use some of the exploits on multiple firmware and model numbers. Um, so it's quite a, quite groovy uh, to uh, do this. Of course, only do it legally. And uh, to show you, for instance, I ran across this when I was helping with uh, some of the NATO and European Union member state uh, cyber warfare exercises in Brussels not too long ago. And what I found was this is an actual power station uh, that I found using Shodan. And when I went to look further with various other tools and, of course, with permission, um, on that uh, power plant and on the piece of Modbus hardware that they have, uh, they also uh, had, unfortunately, a remote access Trojan called uh, Extreme Rat installed. And you can see the banner uh, that shows for this particular version of Extreme Rat. Um, so these things are already present in some power stations and water facilities and et cetera. Now, another very common uh, control protocol is BACnet. And many of us have various different types of thermostats that are digital. And this is just one way that you can use BACnet. It's using a bevy of different ways. And if we take a look at this simple thermostat, uh, we can break down what uh, some of the digits actually mean. And uh, what we can do is flip that around and find some of these objects directly connected to the internet. And BACnet does have some uh, security uh, features, but not that many. Uh, so if I break down looking at census.io, these are the different types of BACnet fields that you can find, which is quite groovy because if you want to, for instance, uh, look at only certain firmware revisions or application sof software revisions uh, or model names um, or vendor IDs, you can go ahead and zoom into these. Because every vendor that uses BACnet, uh, similar to Modbus, has to have a registered vendor ID. So a groovy tool that I like to use uh, with BACnet to look even further is from Contemporary Controls BACnet Discovery Tools. And again, this is free. Uh, unfortunately, uh, most of these tools require uh, Windows. Uh, it's because there's a lot of Windows and control environments. And you can install this Ruby tool, and it does something similar to the Modbus scanner tool from Chipkin, where it will show everything that's connected on the back end to the BACnet tool. And it will also show, for instance, those object names, which is you know, temperature. And uh, this is quite handy. Um, also, another thing to add is Magnet uses port 47808 and uses UDP predominantly. So uh, this is a very interesting protocol because uh, it has gotten very, very big. And it is used in all sorts of places. And it's also had some noted security issues where it's taken time for uh, the people behind uh, Tritium to actually issue patches. Um, it is driven on Java, Java, Java. And uh, it could be in your elevator. It could be in a private or police security station. 
uh, it can be in your, your airport. Luckily, not many of us can fly, right? Um, it can be in a bit of everywhere. And think about some of the mayhem that could be done if you're able to get into some of these different devices. So uh, it goes kind of by two names, Tritium or Fox Protocol. And on Census, here's some of the things that you can pick up on. Um, you can pick up on the application version, so you can go ahead and map that to any known exploits or uh, actually uh, download uh, the package yourself. And then uh, in your home lab, of course, with permission, you can uh, start fooling around with some of this stuff to see what else you can find. You can do the host ID, uh, which is quite handy uh, in many different ways, the ID version, station name, etc. And uh, you can do a lot with this particular profile, or excuse me, uh, protocol. So I like to have a lot of fun with Fox. And one of the ways that you can uh, look at some of these systems, with permission, of course, is there is a free product for download. This will also run on Linux. Um, and what it does is it's open source, Java-based, and it will uh, basically connect to any embedded system that's running it. And it tries to keep it vendor neutral. So uh, it won't just be vendor A, B, and C, but not D. Um, it'll basically connect to anything. And even though there are some uh, security settings, um, a lot of organizations have not actually set them up. Yay! Please hack me. Um, and in addition to that, I wanted to list a few more tools that might interest you, and these are free. Uh, Chipkin is an organization that does a lot with uh, technicians that deal with MacNet, Modbus, and a few other, uh, we'll say, more industrial IoT and control systems. And they've got a bevy of tools, which is fantastic because they also do not security test their tools. And you can weaponize them even further uh, if you would like in a controlled manner, legally only. I am not a lawyer, remember that. So, not long ago, I got this uh, very interesting offer. And one thing to remember about control systems, it's similar to what you may have heard of with cars. A CAN bus is a CAN bus. Well, a control system is also a control system. So even boats uh, have these different things. So when I talk about a boat, it's a really big boat, like liquid gas transport, or cargo ships. And there was an organization I was uh, working with as an advisor that uh, specialized in maritime security. And uh, they were trying to get the cyber part started. The majority of the stuff they did was maritime intelligence, uh, trying to find uh, ships that go dark on purpose, uh, turning off their identification transponder so they they can, I don't know, smuggle arms, people, refuse to rescue people in the Mediterranean, uh, if they're refugees, yeah, little things like that. So uh, we got an offer to hack a very, very large boat worth uh, almost 200 million pounds. And, of course, me thinking, hmm, what are all of the lovely things that could go wrong with a very, very large boat? So I made a few conditions. Uh, one of them was um, when uh, we stole the boat, I got to wear an eye patch. Uh, secondly, um, I got to say uh, once the boat was, I should say, liberated, um, I got to uh, say, look at me, look at me. I am the captain now uh, wearing my eye patch. And one of the things you have to remember um, about maritime is uh, there's a lot of legacy stuff just like uh, industrial and production systems. So fun fact, um, really big ships, uh, their control mechanism uh, is actually uh, controlled via the civilian band of GPS. And there are already known um, ways to exploit the civilian band. Uh, these are not tied to the military GPS control. So the captain of a ship uh, does control the ship However, uh, the majority of where the ship goes is actually controlled uh, with the civilian GPS control system. 
Um, another thing um, about maritime is a lot of them use different forms of something called Windows CE, which uh, depending on the age of the ship and the last time it's been retrofitted, um, it could be using um, versions that are based off of Windows XP, Windows 7, and only the newest and greatest stuff is going to be based off of Windows 10. And one of the things uh, that concerns many people about Windows CE is it is for embedded systems and it's in compact uh, edition. And it doesn't have all the bells and whistles. So out of the box, it's not going to be logging everything that you would expect with professional um, edition. Uh, it's also going to be slower to patch from Microsoft because they know that a lot of industrial systems use these. Um, and uh, there, there's a heavy, a wonderful mayhem that can be done with various different types of Windows CE. Uh, another thing to consider when we're talking about maritime is there are uh, multiple entry and exit points on a large ship. They have to keep in contact with uh, a lot of different things. There's something called uh, the AIS system, uh, two different forms uh, that was uh, mandated for larger ships to use to avoid hitting other ships, which is kind of nice. Um, but uh, it also uh, automatically has contacts with things like buoys, land stations, and other things. And the AIS protocol um, background, I've been building a, a few tools because I know that there are uh, various security issues with that particular protocol. And that's one of the ways that uh, the ship in question um, was liberated. Um, then you also have uh, VSAT systems, UHF systems sometimes, and different other types of communications. And um, one of the problems with these is, again, they might be legacy, but also the manufacturers are not in the security business. So I can find, for instance, VSAT systems directly connected to the internet that's giving way too much information that could uh, then be turned around and remotely controlled uh, because they're exploitable in many cases. And even where there is security, uh, several of the major manufacturers for some of these, including some of the 3G, 4G modems that are also in use with the larger ships, is um, they'll use what's called known private keys, which equals, I tried to encrypt but not really. So uh, even boats can be yours. Now, uh, many of us are not in Vegas. I'm in my tiny house in Amsterdam. Uh, and we've done a lot of increased teleworking. Everything is remote now. Here's a new hashtag, bring your own house, because the regular, say, office um, or power plant uh, security is now in your living room or in your home office. Um, many people have to share their home network with uh, their partners, uh, their Roomba, in my case, my partner, um, children, or especially if you're stealing your neighbor's Wi-Fi to watch this presentation right now. But uh, when you have to do work, let's say you're doing sensitive stuff, Let's say you are a process engineer that can't go into your place of work and have to do things more and more remote. Woohoo! Guess what? Your infrastructure could be mine. Because one of the problems is when things are rapidly set up, especially during a pandemic, they might not be using the newest, greatest, most patched and updated things. Um, and another thing to consider is a lot of production and industrial systems uh, the manufacturers, uh, we'll just pick one out of the air, Honeywell, for example, they'll say, hey, we have all this equipment at your plant, uh, but to maintain the warranty uh, and the service agreement, uh, when you paid all this money for this plant, we need a direct connection to constantly pull data and look at the infrastructure to make sure everything is working correctly. Um, by the way, we're going to use a really old version of BNC and all of our technicians use the same exact credentials to connect to all of our worldwide customers. Yay! Otherwise known as a technician backdoor in these cases. And if you say, hey, Honeywell, you know, that's not very secure. And they're like, hey, you know what's even less secure? 
um, not having a warranty on all of your uh, hardware. And you're like, oh, yeah, we'll be using that old version of BNC. So uh, with this wonderful uh, 2020 trying to kill us pandemic uh, really hit, I went ahead and scanned the internet and took the top 10 countries with assets that uh, say hello to the internet. Um, and that's in the yellowish. Um, I'm not sure how much you can see because of the big DEF CON logo. And in the orangish um, bar, those are remote only um, access uh, protocols that I was looking for and also certain versions, like older versions of SSH, uh, FTP, remote desktop protocol, um, et cetera. So what I found was, for instance, the United States has 47,500,000 assets. Out of those assets, when I was looking only for known exploitable remote access vulnerabilities, uh, there were almost 12 and a half million ones that I could find for the United States, which is not a great ratio. However, I will say that uh, some of the assets that I scanned, uh, they can have multiple vulnerabilities. Uh, looking at between uh, the U.S. and China, uh, China has almost eight and a half million, but almost uh, assets on the internet that say hello, but almost five million of those are remotable with known uh, exploits and vulnerabilities in them. Uh, the one country that did fare uh, fairly well was actually the United Kingdom uh, with their ratio between assets and exploitable vulnerabilities. And one of the reasons for that was several years ago, uh, they did something uh, very fantastic. They instituted this thing uh, a cyber program uh, for anyone doing business with the UK and also critical infrastructure had to uh, really take a look at their stuff and go ahead and pass an, an audit, in most cases a self-audit, depending on your level of access with the government and also critical infrastructure. And they were able to get a head start. And so they actually are doing fairly well in comparison to the rest of the top tenors. So another thing that we have to consider is because um, things are now industrial IoT devices or IoT devices, this means that you can have a control system uh, that is IoT enabled. Now in this case, um, I like to take a look at Tesla stuff because I just do. And uh, you can actually uh, use census.io, um, what I call census dork, to find various Tesla power walls. And uh, what's interesting about this is even though Tesla has some security, it's still single factor authentication. Uh, there's still a web interface. Uh, the customer doesn't necessarily have to set up any real security. So there's admin admin kind of stuff, uh, depending on the version of the software. Uh, Tesla does not force down updates like uh, Windows 10 or their cars. Uh, so there are a lot of old versions, and what you can uh, actually pull back is the configuration of the power walls, the versions, timestamps showing the last login, how long it's been up, if it's updating or not, and a bevy of other diagnostic information. And uh, what's unfortunate is uh, if you're able to get into some of these systems, um, which uh, you can, um, you can uh, do more nefarious things. Uh, like imagine a region of power walls that suddenly all of their electricity got dumped on the uh, energy grid. That would be a very bad thing. Or if it was connected to some sort of crucial hardware, um, that would be a bad thing. And in this particular case, this one was uh, connected to a crane. Who doesn't want to own their own crane? Well, you can too. Um, so you have to understand that if it's running a web server, I don't care if it's, um, I don't know, power bank or piece of industrial equipment or whatever, you can hack it like a web server. Remember that. So um, I do a lot in aviation. Um, sometimes that's good. Sometimes they hate me. So either way, you know. Um, 
so there are various ways to get into various things, and uh, one of the dangers that we have is a lot of remote desktop uh, protocol. You can actually buy exploited systems on the scary dark web um, from a dollar to ten dollars a piece. Uh, if they have RDP, $10 is for typically U.S. military assets that are found. In this case, uh, this one belongs to Airbus, where luckily the admin happens to be logged in. I wonder what the password might be. Uh, and the CN is actually the certificate, which I could match up to absolutely belonging to Airbus. Another fun fact is depending on the aircraft, some Airbus aircraft actually use Windows CE in their aircraft. Yay! So I'm not sure uh, you may or may not have heard much about Boeing other than some of their planes like to fall from the sky because they have software issues. And uh, starting last year, one of the things I did, uh, and by the way, hi, Boeing, I know you still want to put me in jail, um, was that I took a look around uh, some of their infrastructure and found that it was uh, incredibly bad. Um, for instance, at the time, uh, Boeing.com and its websites didn't even use HTTPS or any encryption for their websites. And this included login systems. Yay! Um, I was able to get into the R&D section of their flight control software, which also included the 737 MAX aircraft, uh, because to authenticate, I was using Firefox with no script running, and uh, the website had a message, you were ru not running scripts. Please press this bus button. Press the button. I was in. How awesome is that? Uh, there were, you know, six cross-site scripting vulnerabilities in the uh, live in production uh, flight control aviation ID system, Woo -hoo -hoo, right? And the interesting thing about this is if you can get into the flight control system or software um, and you know what you are doing, uh, the process is a technician will download what's needed for their aircraft, put it on a maintenance laptop, that maintenance laptop then plugs into the aircraft itself. Uh, into the flight control system. Uh, so imagine some of the mayhem that you could do because Boeing had zero effort uh, and zero uh, knowledge in uh, security. Uh, funny enough, uh, they do sell cybersecurity services as consultants to the U.S. government. However, I guess they never ate their own dog food and looked at their own stuff. There were even hard-coded credentials in uh, an older version of SAML that you could easily decode. Um, the response from Boeing was, you're a criminal, um, harassment, uh, no bug bounty. Um, and it was only after uh, my 59-page report went through and it got media attention after a disclosure period that uh, they were forced to start their first vulnerability disclosure program. Um, which they said it was based on my report. However, as far as I'm aware, Boeing still gives zero uh, bug bounty awards. So agriculture is nice because I think all of us like to eat. And um, this is an instance where it's a control system that is now an industrial IoT system that is hanging on the internet uh, that has a web server that has never been security tested with no authentication. And it happens to be a European um, uh, fish farm, a salmon farm to be exact. And uh, you can actually um, in real life, like press the buttons and uh, you can modify the operations of this. So we like water. Uh, Mexichem is actually a major uh, bottled water uh, provider manufacturer amongst other things uh, in Latin America and South Africa. I do a, a lot of stuff. So um, I was looking around because I get curious and bored. And I was very quickly able to uh, find, uh, because they allowed LDAP uh, to be exposed to the internet, uh, I found 24 pages of assets uh, from the IT side on the business level all the way down to on the control level for their Windows-based uh, SCADA systems. And this was rather unfortunate uh, because um, 
some of the systems that I was able to find was this wonderful, uh, what's called HMI, Human Machine Interface, uh, the same exact version that was vulnerable to some of the black energy attacks. And um, you didn't actually have to log in because it was never set up correctly. Um, I could access the drives that it was attached to. I could import and delete uh, recipes, which is actually the, uh, the production recipe of what the machinery will be doing. And I could just click as many buttons as I wanted to. I could even export the administration data all at the touch of my fingertips from my comfortable small Amsterdam house. And uh, Mexichem also produces uh, various different types of chemicals, some of which are more controlled uh, so that they don't fall in the hands of uh, really bad people who want to make things go boom. So another thing to consider is um, we're talking about IoT systems. They can be uh, anywhere. Uh, they could be inside a hospital, they could be on sensitive networks, they could be at nuclear physics labs in Russia, um, and uh, they, they could also be inside uh, control systems uh, so that you can actually, you know, use a printer. And um, so I was able to uh, have a bit of fun um, Again, being bored, don't ever let me get bored, and uh, use uh, census and a few other uh, scanning tools to quickly find as many uh, particular printers as possible. Um, it, it stemmed from the fact I was having a problem with my printer, and I downloaded the uh, Brother Admin tool, which covers almost all of their models, and I noticed that it had never been security tested. So I went ahead and flipped it around and turned it into a dual use weaponized uh, piece of admin tool. And a lot of these printers will have web interfaces. So I had a lot of fun with cross-site scripting, but most of my fun came from using the admin tool. See, once you find one of these printers, it's not that difficult to find, you can use the free brother admin tool Go ahead and put in the IP address and then connect to somebody else's printer anywhere in the world. You can see how much ink they have. You can even order if it's set up in their printer um, ink and toner supplies because, hey, toner's worth more than platinum. Um, and you can also send files directly to the printer. Um, so I had a lot of fun with this. Um, but uh, unfortunately, Brother, like most printer manufacturers, do not have a vulnerability disclosure program, nor did they ever think that you could use this lovely free tool available now to download and you can weaponize it and really make uh, printers' lives uncomfortable. Uh, bonus item, if it's a multifunctional printer that's more of the commercial variety that has a hard drive installed and say human resources uses it as a scanner for different types of identification systems, you can even access the hard drive where it saves those scans and get all sorts of personally identifiable information and health data just by using this tool. So I like space and uh, one of the things that is a bit problematic is uh, just like uh, regular industrial systems, once you put something in space, it's expected to last a while. There's even a space satellite that uh, is in a very interesting um, orbit uh, that is up there for over 50 years. There's a lot of legacy stuff. Um, once you put something up there, it's not like you can go, hey, guess what? We've got this new type of encryption. You know what? It needs a chip to be able to process it. We're just going to replace that chip in the satellite. That doesn't happen. Um, and what we did last year was in the United Kingdom, uh, thanks to Oxford, who funded it, and de Montfort University, we held the first space hackathon at Royal Holloway University uh, to discuss these things with uh, cleared PhD students who were given uh, a lot of information by myself and others 
on uh, some of the problems with current and new space assets uh, because they're really industrial IoT devices and uh, how to uh, combat some of those problems because encryption might not be there. I believe it was only uh, the year before last that the FTC mandated that new space asset actually had to have the ability to use encryption. And we've seen some satellite systems being used in various cyber crime uh, attacks and malware because if you can um, put one of your hops and traceability on a satellite, it kind of makes it a bit hard to see who's actually behind different things. So a lot of cool stuff came out of this hackathon. PhD students were absolutely fantastic and energetic. Uh, they listed a lot of um, very pertinent risks that we had to consider, such as um, the current uh, UN space treaties do not cover private companies when it comes to warfare. Uh, it only covers uh, nation states. And the fact that uh, some major players in the market, um, if you want to watch a great uh, older movie, I believe it's called Moonraker. It's a James Bond movie where a really rich guy with way too much money um, decides to go into space and then try to take over the world by going to war in space as a private company. And so uh, some of the uh, risks listed uh, were, for example, um, Elon Musk and his program, because anyone can turn evil. And he already thinks that uh, the pyramids were created by aliens. So uh, to give a brief example, you can actually find some of these systems. Uh, now, there's uh, different ways that you can find various space IoT systems. A lot of them you'll find are actually land systems that then communicate up, but those land systems, uh, they can actually unfortunately be hacked. Uh, in this particular case, I was able to find a relay uh, connection up to a satellite. And uh, I didn't want to give away too much information because they have not gotten back to me. Um, I was able to find this particular device was running my favorite protocol Modbus with no authentication. It could give the device ID, function codes, and all sorts of information about it. And by looking into uh, various user manuals that are freely available, I was able to find that it was called a sunny string monitor that was attached to the satellite. And what it does is it looks for uh, sun and uh, goes ahead and opens a solar array on a satellite system to give a power or closes it down uh, when uh, there's nothing available or can move it around a little bit. So imagine what you could do with that. So why is this kind of important? Uh, last month, uh, the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research asked me to give a presentation, a closed dialogue session to permanent member states uh, with other member states as observers. And I brought up the fact that um, we need to be a lot more proactive. And uh, although the United Nations in 2015 established that member states are uh, responsible for securing their ICT cyberspace. That also includes space assets. That also includes industrial systems, et cetera. Um, they uh, agreed to establish a computer emergency response team. And that's well and good. It's fantastic. It's much needed. But uh, that also is very, very reactive and constantly are putting out fires. So it's very difficult for you to be proactive. So uh, I brought up with them that I'm currently working with part of the European Union to uh, actually establish their first proactive computer emergency protection team, a CEPT. And CERT step one, CEPT step two, um, to try to alleviate some of the burden and also try to catch things as quickly as possible before they become major incidents. Um, now, back in 2009, this is also another reason why it's kind of important is I detected a cyber warfare attack, the second wave of such attacks uh, caused by malware that the North Koreans created. One of the things they did was they leveraged higher speed bandwidth in Northern Europe uh, to go ahead and have those various devices aim at the South Korean uh, infrastructure and also part of the infrastructure of the United States. So they attacked the South Korean version of the White House and also the U.S. version of the White House. Uh, they tried to affect uh, the New York Stock Exchange and a lot of other uh, very important places. And because um, 
we were also monitoring in my uh, shop ICS uh, systems that had internet connectivity. Uh, we found that some of the Windows-based stuff uh, actually uh, was also affected and was uh, trying to take down part of South Korea and the US. So uh, you can actually, unfortunately, weaponize with various types of malware, IT, IoT, and ICS, as we keep seeing. But even in 2009, 11 years ago, uh, we were seeing this type of stuff. So we need to take it much more seriously with the vendors, um, as well as the critical infrastructure operators and get the tech community involved because academia is great. Uh, government experts are fantastic, but it's us and you watching this that have that uh, hacker mentality and can actually uh, express it and find ways in and out that others can't. So uh, with that, I will be available on Discord for questions. Um, hopefully I get the right Discord channel. I uh, wanted to give a huge shout out to Omar, uh, at Santo Omar and the Red Team Village for inviting me. Uh, if you also would like to contact me about things that are going on in the Middle East, uh, I believe my contact information is now on the Middle East Institute's uh, website. And feel free to contact me on Twitter and I take DMs just no weird pictures no weird sexy time pictures let me stress that i love pictures of cats so thank you very very much red team village it is greatly appreciated thank you so much for supporting us and for the great presentation you're getting a lot of kudos in discord so talking about discord if you're joining us you know you can see the link in the bottom of the screen there's a link to a website where um, you know it has a, a lot of other information about the speakers along with, you know, all the activities that are happening in, of course, in DEF CON. So with that said, we're going to go in a break for a few minutes, and then the next presentation will be up uh, in probably about 15 to 20 minutes. So thank you again, Chris. Thank Great you. presentation. Have a nice one. All right. Cheers. Mm -hmm.